A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Golden Touch. Once upon a time there lived a very rich man, and a king besides, whose name was Midas, and he had a little daughter, whom nobody but myself ever heard of, and whose name I either never knew or have entirely forgotten, so, because I love odd names for little girls, I choose to call her Marigold. This King Midas was fonder of gold than of anything else in the world. He valued his royal crown chiefly because it was composed of that precious metal. If he loved anything better, or half so well, it was the one little maiden who played so merrily around her father's footstool. But the more Midas loved his daughter, the more did he desire and seek for wealth. He thought, foolish man, that the best thing he could possibly do for this dear child would be to bequeath her the immensest pile of yellow glistening coin that had ever been heaped together since the world was made. Thus he gave all his thoughts and all his time to this one purpose. If ever he happened to gaze for an instant at the gold-tinted clouds of sunset, he wished that they were real gold, and that they could be squeezed safely into his strong box. When little Marigold ran to meet him with a bunch of buttercups and dandelions, he used to say, Pooh, poor child, if these flowers were as golden as they look, they would be worth the plucking. And yet, in his earlier days, before he was so entirely possessed of this insane desire for riches, King Midas had shown a great taste for flowers. He had planted a garden in which grew the biggest and beautifulest and sweetest roses that any mortal ever saw or smelt. These roses were still growing in the garden, as large, as lovely, and as fragrant as when Midas used to pass whole hours gazing at them and inhaling their perfume. But now, if he looked at them at all, it was only to calculate how much the garden would be worth if each of the innumerable rose petals were a thin plate of gold. And though he was once fond of music, in spite of an idle story about his ears, which was said to resemble those of an ass, the only music for poor Midas now was the chink of one coin against another. At length, as people always grow more and more foolish unless they take care to grow wiser and wiser, Midas had got to be so exceedingly unreasonable that he could scarcely bear to see or touch any object that was not gold. He made it his custom, therefore, to pass a large portion of every day in a dark and dreary apartment underground at the basement of his palace. It was here that he kept his wealth. To this dismal hole, for it was little better than a dungeon, Midas betook himself whenever he wanted to be particularly happy. Here, after carefully locking the door, he would take a bag of gold coin, or a gold cup as big as a washbowl, or a heavy golden bar, or a peck measure of gold dust, and bring them from the obscure corners of the room into the one bright and narrow sunbeam that fell from the dungeon-like window. He valued the sunbeam for no other reason but that his treasure would not shine without its help. And then would he reckon over the coins in the bag, toss up the bar, and catch it as it came down, sift the gold dust through his fingers, look at the funny image of his own face as reflected in the burnished circumference of the cup, and whisper to himself, O oh, Midas, rich King Midas, what a happy man thou art! But it was laughable to see how the image of his face kept grinning at him out of the polished surface of the cup. It seemed to be aware of his foolish behaviour, and to have a naughty inclination to make fun of him. Midas called himself a happy man, but felt that he was not yet quite so happy as he might be. The very tip-top of enjoyment would never be reached unless the whole world were to become his treasure-room, and be filled with yellow metal which should all be his own. Now, I need hardly remind such wise little people as you are, that in the old, old times when King Midas was alive, a great many things came to pass which we should consider wonderful if they were to happen in our own day and country. And on the other hand, a great many things take place nowadays which seem not only wonderful to us, but at which the people of old times would have stared their eyes out. On the whole, I regard our times as the strangest of the two. But, however that may be, I must go on with my story. Midas was enjoying himself in his treasure-room one day, as usual, when he perceived a shadow fall over the heaps of gold, 
and looking suddenly up, what should he behold but the figure of a stranger, standing in the bright and narrow sunbeam? It was a young man, with a cheerful and ruddy face. Whether it was the imagination of King Midas threw a yellow tinge over everything, or whatever the cause might be, he could not help fancying that the smile with which the stranger regarded him had a kind of golden radiance to it. Certainly, although his figure intercepted the sunshine, there was now a brighter gleam upon all the piled-up treasure than before. Even the remotest corners had their share of it, and were lighted up when the stranger smiled, as with tips of flame and sparkles of fire. As Midas knew that he had carefully turned the key in the lock, and that no mortal strength could possibly break into his treasure-room, he of course concluded that his visitor must be something more than mortal. It is no matter about telling you who he was. In those days, when the earth was a comparatively new affair, it was supposed to be often the resort of beings endowed with supernatural power, and who used to interest themselves in the joys and sorrows of men, women, and children, half playfully and half seriously. Midas had met such beings before now, and was not sorry to meet one of them again. The stranger's aspect, indeed, was so good-humoured and kindly, if not beneficent, that it would have been unreasonable to suspect him of intending any mischief. It was far more probable that he came to do Midas a favour. And what could that favour be, unless to multiply his heaps of treasure? The stranger gazed about the room, and when his lustrous smile had glistened upon all the golden objects that were there, he turned again to Midas. "'You are a wealthy man, friend Midas,' he observed. I doubt whether any other four walls on earth contain so much gold as you have contrived to pile up in this room." "'I have done pretty well, pretty well,' answered Midas, in a discontented tone. "'But after all, it is but a trifle when you consider that it has taken my whole life to get it together. If one could live a thousand years, he might have time to grow rich." "'What?' exclaimed the stranger. "'Then you are not satisfied?' Midas shook his head. "'And pray, what would satisfy you?' asked the stranger. "'Merely for the curiosity of the thing, I should be glad to know.' Midas paused and meditated. He felt a presentiment that this stranger, with such a golden lustre in his good-humoured smile, had come hither with both the power and the purpose of gratifying his utmost wishes. And now, therefore, was the fortunate moment, when he had but to speak and obtain whatever possible or seemingly impossible thing it might come into his head to ask. So he thought, and thought, and thought, and heaped up one golden mountain upon another in his imagination, without being able to imagine them big enough. At last a bright idea occurred to King Midas. It seemed really as bright as the glistening metal which he loved so much. Raising his head, he looked the lustrous stranger in the face. "'Well, Midas,' observed the visitor, "'I see that you have at length hit upon something that will satisfy you. Tell me your wish.' "'It is only this,' replied Midas. "'I am weary of collecting my treasures with so much trouble, and beholding the heap so diminutive, after I have done my best. I wish everything that I touch to be changed to gold.' The stranger's smile grew so very broad that it seemed to fill the room like an outburst of the sun gleaming into a shadowy dell, where the yellow autumnal leaves, for so look the lumps and particles of gold, lie strewn in the glow of light. "'The golden touch!' exclaimed he. "'You certainly deserve credit, friend Midas, for striking out so brilliant a conception. But are you quite sure that this will satisfy you?' "'How could it fail?' said Midas. "'And will you never regret the possession of it?' "'What could induce me?' asked Midas. "'I ask nothing else to render me perfectly happy.' "'Be it as you wish, then,' replied the stranger, waving his hand in token of farewell. "'Tomorrow, at sunrise, you will find yourself gifted with the golden touch.' The figure of the stranger then became exceedingly bright, and Midas involuntarily closed his eyes. On opening them again, he beheld only one yellow sunbeam in the room, and, all around him, the glistening of the precious metal which he had spent his life in hoarding up. Whether Midas slept as usual that night, the story does not say, 
Asleep or awake, however, his mind was probably in the state of a child's to whom a beautiful new plaything has been promised in the morning. At any rate, day had hardly peeped over the hills when King Midas was broadly awake, and stretching his arms out of bed, began to touch the objects that were within reach. He was anxious to prove whether the golden touch had really come, according to the stranger's promise. So he laid his fingers on a chair by the bedside, and on various other things, but was grievously disappointed to perceive that they remained of exactly the same substance as before. Indeed, he felt very much afraid that he had only dreamed about the lustrous stranger, or else the latter had been making game of him. And what a miserable affair would it be if, after all his hopes, Midas must content himself with what little gold he could scrape together by ordinary means, instead of creating it by a touch. All this while it was only the grey of the morning, with but a streak of brightness along the edge of the sky where Midas could not see it. He lay in a very disconsolate mood, regretting the downfall of his hopes, and kept growing sadder and sadder, until the earliest sunbeam shone through the window and gilded the ceiling over his head. It seemed to Midas that this bright yellow sunbeam was reflected in rather a singular way on the white covering of the bed. Looking more closely, what was his astonishment and delight when he found that this linen fabric had been transmuted into what seemed a woven texture of the purest and brightest gold. The golden touch had come to him with the first sunbeam. Midas started up in a kind of joyful frenzy, and ran about the room, grasping at everything that happened to be in his way. He seized one of the bedposts, and it became immediately a fluted golden pillar. He pulled aside a window curtain, in order to admit a clearer spectacle of the wonders which he was performing, and the tassel grew heavy in his hand, a mass of gold. He took up a book from the table. At his first touch it assumed the appearance of such a splendidly bound and gilt-edged volume as one often meets with nowadays, but on running his fingers through the leaves, behold, it was a bundle of thin golden plates, in which all the wisdom of the book had grown illegible. He hurriedly put on his clothes, and was enraptured to see himself in a magnificent suit of gold cloth, which retained its flexibility and softness, although it burdened him a little with its weight. He drew out his handkerchief, which little Marigold had hemmed for him. That was likewise gold, with the dear child's neat and pretty stitches running all along the border in gold thread. Somehow or other this last transformation did not quite please King Midas. He would rather that his little daughter's handiwork should have remained just the same as when she climbed his knee and put it into his hand. But it was not worth while to vex himself about a trifle. Midas now took his spectacles from his pocket and put them on his nose in order that he might see more distinctly what he was about. In those days spectacles for common people had not been invented, but were already worn by kings, else how would Midas have any? To his great perplexity, however, excellent as his glasses were, he discovered that he could not possibly see through them. But this was the most natural thing in the world, for, on taking them off, the transparent crystal turned out to be plates of yellow metal, and of course were worthless as spectacles, though valuable as gold. It struck Midas as rather inconvenient that, with all his wealth, he could never again be rich enough to own a pair of serviceable spectacles. "'It is no great matter, nevertheless,' said he to himself, very philosophically. "'We cannot expect any great good without its being accompanied with some small inconvenience. The golden touch is worth the sacrifice of a pair of spectacles, at least, if not one's very eyesight. My own eyes will serve for ordinary purposes, and little Marigold will soon be old enough to read to me.' Wise King Midas was so exalted by his good fortune that the palace seemed not sufficiently spacious to contain him. He therefore went downstairs, and smiled on observing that the balustrade of the staircase became a bar of burnished gold as his hand passed over it in his descent. He lifted the door-latch, it was brass only a moment ago, but golden when his fingers quitted it, and emerged into the garden. Here, as it happened, he found a great number of beautiful roses in full bloom, and others in all the stages of lovely bud and blossom. Very delicious was their fragrance in the morning breeze. Their delicate blush was one of the fairest sights in the world. So gentle, so modest, and so full of sweet tranquillity did these roses seem to be. But Midas knew a way to make them far more precious, 
according to his way of thinking, than roses had ever been before. So he took great pains in going from bush to bush, and exercised his magic touch most indefatigably, until every individual flower and bud, and even the worms at the heart of some of them, were changed to gold. By the time this good work was completed, King Midas was summoned to breakfast, and as the morning air had given him an excellent appetite, he made haste back to the palace. What was usually a king's breakfast in the days of Midas? I really do not know, and cannot stop now to investigate. To the best of my belief, however, on this particular morning, the breakfast consisted of hot cakes, some nice little brook trout, roasted potatoes, fresh boiled eggs, and coffee for King Midas himself, and a bowl of bread and milk for his daughter Marigold. At all events, this is a breakfast fit to set before a king, and whether he had it or not, King Midas could not have had a better. Little Marigold had not yet made her appearance. Her father ordered her to be called, and, seating himself at table, awaited the child's coming in order to begin his own breakfast. To do Midas justice, he really loved his daughter, and loved her so much the more this morning on account of the good fortune which had befallen him. It was not a great while before he heard her coming along the passageway, crying bitterly. This circumstance surprised him, because Marigold was one of the cheerfullest little people whom you would see in a summer's day, and hardly shed a thimbleful of tears in a twelvemonth. When Midas heard her sobs, he determined to put little Marigold into better spirits by an agreeable surprise. So, leaning across the table, he touched his daughter's bowl, which was a china one with pretty figures all round it, and transmuted it into gleaming gold. Meanwhile, Marigold slowly and disconsolately opened the door and showed herself with her apron at her eyes, still sobbing as if her heart would break. "'How now, my little lady?' cried Midas. "'Pray, what is the matter with you this bright morning?' Marigold, without taking the apron from her eyes, held out her hand, in which was one of the roses which Midas had so recently transmuted. "'Beautiful!' exclaimed her father. "'And what is there in this magnificent golden rose to make you cry?' "'Ah, dear father,' answered the child, as well as her sobs would let her, it is not beautiful, but the ugliest flower that ever grew. As soon as I was dressed, I ran into the garden to gather some roses for you, because I know you like them, and like them the better when gathered by your little daughter. But, oh dear, dear me, what do you think has happened? Such a misfortune! All the beautiful roses that smelled so sweetly, and had so many lovely blushes, are blighted and spoiled. They are grown quite yellow, as you see this one and have no longer any fragrance. What can have been the matter with them?" "'Poor, oh, my dear little girl, pray don't cry about it,' said Midas, who was ashamed to confess that he himself had wrought the change which so greatly afflicted her. "'Sit down and eat your bread and milk. You will find it easy enough to exchange a golden rose like that, which will last hundreds of years, for an ordinary one which would wither in a day.' "'I don't care for such roses as this,' cried Marigold tossing it contemptuously away. It has no smell, and the hard petals prick my nose." The child now sat down to table, but was so occupied with her grief for the blighted roses that she did not even notice the wonderful transmutation in her china bowl. Perhaps this was all the better, for Marigold was accustomed to take pleasure in looking at the queer figures and strange trees and houses that were painted on the circumference of the bowl and these ornaments were now entirely lost in the yellow hue of the metal. Midas, meanwhile, had poured out a cup of coffee, and as a matter of course the coffee-pot, whatever metal it may have been when he took it up, was gold when he set it down. He thought to himself that it was rather an extravagant style of splendour in a king of his simple habits to breakfast off a service of gold, and began to be puzzled with the difficulty of keeping his treasures safe. The cupboard and the kitchen would no longer be a secure place of deposit for articles so valuable as golden bowls and coffee-pots. Amid these thoughts he lifted a spoonful of coffee to his lips, and sipping it was astonished to perceive that, the instant his lips touched the liquid, it became molten gold, and the next moment hardened into a lump. "'Ah!' exclaimed Midas, rather aghast. "'What is the matter, father?' 
asked little Marigold, gazing at him, with tears still standing in her eyes. "'Nothing, child, nothing,' said Midas. "'Eat your milk before it gets quite cold.' He took one of the nice little trouts on his plate, and by way of experiment touched its tail with his finger. To his horror it was immediately transmuted from an admirably fried brook-trout into a goldfish, though not one of those goldfishes which people often keep in glass globes as ornaments for the parlour. No, but it was really a metallic fish, and looked as if it had been very cunningly made by the nicest goldsmith in the world. Its little bones were now golden wires, its fins and tail were thin plates of gold, and there were the marks of the fork in it, and all the delicate, frothy appearance of a nicely fried fish, exactly imitated in metal. A very pretty piece of work, as you may suppose. Only King Midas, just at that moment, would much rather have had a real trout in his dish than this elaborate and valuable imitation of one. "'I don't quite see,' thought he to himself, "'how I am to get any breakfast.' He took one of the smoking hot cakes, and had scarcely broken it, when, to his cruel mortification, though a moment before it had been of the whitest wheat, it assumed the yellow hue of Indian meal. To say the truth, if it had really been a hot Indian cake, Midas would have prized it a good deal more than he now did, when its solidity and increased weight made him too bitterly sensible that it was gold. Almost in despair he helped himself to a boiled egg which immediately underwent a change similar to those of the trout and the cake. The egg, indeed, might have been mistaken for one of those which the famous goose in the story-book was in the habit of laying. But King Midas was the only goose that had anything to do with the matter. "'Well, this is a quandary,' thought he, leaning back in his chair and looking quite enviously at little Marigold, who was now eating her bread and milk with great satisfaction. "'Such a costly breakfast before me, and nothing that can be eaten.' hoping that, by dint of great dispatch, he might avoid what he now felt to be a considerable inconvenience. King Midas next snatched a hot potato, and attempted to cram it into his mouth and swallow it in a hurry. But the golden touch was too nimble for him, and he found his mouth full, not of mealy potato, but of solid metal, which so burnt his tongue that he roared aloud, and jumping up from the table, began to dance and stamp about the room, both with pain and affright. "'Father, dear father!' cried little Marigold, who was a very affectionate child. "'Pray, what is the matter? Have you burnt your mouth?' "'Ah, dear child!' groaned Midas dolefully. "'I don't know what is to become of your poor father.' "'And truly, my dear little folks, did you ever hear of such a pitiable case in all your lives? Here was literally the richest breakfast that could be set before a king, and its very richness made it absolutely good for nothing.' The poorest labourer, sitting down to his crust of bread and cup of water, was far better off than King Midas, whose delicate food was really worth its weight in gold. And what was to be done? Already at breakfast Midas was excessively hungry. Would he be less so by dinner-time? And how ravenous would be his appetite for supper, which must undoubtedly consist of the same sort of indigestible dishes as those now before him? How many days, think you, would he survive a continuance of this rich fare? These reflections so troubled wise King Midas, that he began to doubt whether, after all, riches are the one desirable thing in the world, or even the most desirable. But this was only a passing thought. So fascinated was Midas with the glitter of the yellow metal, that he would still have refused to give up the golden touch for so paltry a consideration as a breakfast. Just imagine what a price for one meal's victuals! It would have been the same as paying millions and millions of money, and as many millions more as would take forever to reckon up, for some fried trout, an egg, a potato, a hot cake, and a cup of coffee. It would be quite too dear, thought Midas. Nevertheless, so great was his hunger and the perplexity of his situation, that he again groaned aloud, and very grievously too. Our pretty Marigold could endure it no longer. She sat a moment, gazing at her father, and trying with all the might of her little wits to find out what was the matter with him. Then, with a sweet and sorrowful impulse to comfort him, she started from her chair, and, running to Midas, threw her arms affectionately about his knees. He bent down and kissed her. He felt that his little daughter's love was worth a thousand times more than he gained by the golden touch. 
"'My precious, precious Marigold!' cried he. But Marigold made no answer. Alas! What had he done? How fatal was the gift which the stranger bestowed! The moment the lips of Midas touched Marigold's forehead, a change had taken place. Her sweet, rosy face, so full of affection as it had been, assumed a glittering yellow colour, with yellow teardrops congealing on her cheeks. Her beautiful brown ringlets took the same tint. Her soft and tender little form grew hard and inflexible within her father's encircling arms. Oh, terrible misfortune! The victim of his insatiable desire for wealth, little Marigold was a human child no longer, but a golden statue. Yes, there she was, with the questioning look of love, grief, and pity hardened into her face. It was the prettiest and most woeful sight that ever mortal saw. All the features and tokens of Marigold were there. Even the beloved little dimple remained in her golden chin. But the more perfect was the resemblance, the greater was the father's agony at beholding this golden image, which was all that was left him of a daughter. It had been a favourite phrase of Midas, whenever he felt particularly fond of the child, to say that she was worth her weight in gold. And now the phrase had become literally true. And now, at last, when it was too late, he felt how infinitely a warm and tender heart that loved him exceeded in value all the wealth that could be piled up betwixt the earth and sky. It would be too sad a story if I were to tell you how Midas, in the fullness of all his gratified desires, began to wring his hands and bemoan himself, and how he could neither bear to look at Marigold nor yet to look away from her. Except when his eyes were fixed on the image, he could not possibly believe that she was changed to gold. But stealing another glance, there was the precious little figure with a yellow teardrop on its yellow cheek, and a look so piteous and tender that it seemed as if that very expression must needs soften the gold and make it flesh again. This, however, could not be. So Midas had only to wring his hands and to wish that he were the poorest man in the wide world if the loss of all his wealth might bring back the faintest rose-colour to his dear child's face. While he was in this tumult of despair, he suddenly beheld a stranger standing near the door. Midas bent down his head without speaking, for he recognised the same figure which had appeared to him the day before in the treasure-room, and had bestowed on him this disastrous faculty of the golden touch. The stranger's countenance still wore a smile, which seemed to shed a yellow lustre all about the room and gleamed on little Marigold's image and on the other objects that had been transmuted by the touch of Midas. "'Well, friend Midas,' said the stranger, "'pray, how do you succeed with the golden touch?' Midas shook his head. "'I am very miserable,' said he. "'Very miserable indeed!' exclaimed the stranger. "'And how happens that? Have I not faithfully kept my promise with you?' Have you not everything that your heart desired?" "'Gold is not everything,' answered Midas. "'And I have lost all that my heart really cared for.' "'Ah! So you have made a discovery since yesterday,' observed the stranger. "'Let us see, then, which of these two things do you think is really worth the most? The gift of the golden touch, or one cup of clear cold water?' Oh, blessed water! exclaimed Midas. It will never moisten my parched throat again. The golden touch, continued the stranger, or a crust of bread. A piece of bread, answered Midas, is worth all the gold on earth. The golden touch, asked the stranger, or your own little marigold, warm, soft, and loving, as she was an hour ago. Oh, my child, my dear child, cried poor Midas, wringing his hands, I would not have given that one small dimple in her chin for the power of changing this whole big earth into a solid lump of gold. "'You are wiser than you were, King Midas,' said the stranger, looking seriously at him. "'Your own heart, I perceive, has not been entirely changed from flesh to gold. Were it so, your case would indeed be desperate. But you appear to be still capable of understanding that the commonest things, such as lie within everybody's grasp, 
are more valuable than the riches which so many mortals sigh and struggle after. Tell me, now, do you sincerely desire to rid yourself of this golden touch? It is hateful to me, replied Midas. A fly settled on his nose, but immediately fell to the floor, for it, too, had become gold. Midas shuddered. Go, then, said the stranger, and plunge into the river that glides past the bottom of your garden. Take, likewise, a vase of the same water, and sprinkle it over any object that you may desire to change back again from gold into its former substance. If you do this in earnestness and sincerity, it may possibly repair the mischief which your avarice has occasioned. King Midas bowed low, and when he lifted his head the lustrous stranger had vanished. You will easily believe that Midas lost no time in snatching up a great earthen pitcher, but alas me, it was no longer earthen after he touched it, and hastening to the riverside. As he scampered along, he forced his way through the shrubbery. It was positively marvellous to see how the foliage turned yellow behind him, as if the autumn had been there and nowhere else. On reaching the river's brink, he plunged headlong in, without waiting so much as to pull off his shoes. Poof, 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 snorted King Midas as his head emerged out of the water. Well, this is really a refreshing bath, and I think it must have quite washed away the golden touch. And now for filling my pitcher. As he dipped the pitcher into the water, it gladdened his very heart to see it change from gold into the same good, honest earthen vessel which it had been before he touched it. He was conscious, also, of a change within himself. A cold, hard, and heavy weight seemed to have gone out of his bosom, no doubt his heart had been gradually losing its human substance and transmuting itself into insensible metal, but had now softened back again into flesh. Perceiving a violet that grew on the bank of the river, Midas touched it with his finger, and was overjoyed to find that the delicate flower retained its purple hue instead of undergoing a yellow blight. The curse of the golden touch had therefore really been removed from him. King Midas hastened back to the palace and I suppose the servants knew not what to make of it when they saw their royal master so carefully bringing home an earthen pitcher of water. But that water, which was to undo all the mischief that his folly had wrought, was more precious to Midas than an ocean of molten gold could have been. The first thing he did, as you need hardly be told, was to sprinkle it by handfuls over the golden figure of little Marigold. No sooner did it fall on her than he would have laughed to see how the rosy colour came back to the dear child's cheek, and how she began to sneeze and splutter, and how astonished she was to find herself dripping wet, and her father still throwing more water over her. "'Pray do not, dear father,' cried she, "'see how you have wet my nice frock, which I put on only this morning.' For Marigold did not know that she had been a little golden statue, nor could she remember anything that happened since the moment when she ran with outstretched arms to comfort poor King Midas. Her father did not think it necessary to tell his beloved child how very foolish he had been, but contented himself with showing how much wiser he had now grown. For this purpose he led little Marigold into the garden, where he sprinkled all the remainder of the water over the rose-bushes, and with such good effect that above five thousand roses recovered their beautiful bloom. There were two circumstances, however, which, as long as he lived, used to put King Midas in mind of the golden touch. One was that the sands of the river sparkled like gold. The other, that little Marigold's hair had now a golden tinge, which he had never observed in it before she had been transmuted by the effect of his kiss. This change of hue was really an improvement, and made Marigold's hair richer than in her babyhood. When King Midas had grown quite an old man, and used to trot Marigold's children on his knee, he was fond of telling them this marvellous story, pretty much as I have now told it to you. And then he would stroke their glossy ringlets, and tell them that their hair, likewise, had a rich shade of gold, which they had inherited from their mother. "'And to tell you the truth, my precious little folks,' quoth King Midas, diligently trotting the children all the while, "'ever since that morning I have hated the very sight of all other gold save this.' This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall from clivecatterall.com.